Good evening and welcome. I'm Jillian Kumagai and I'm the manager of the Stanford Health Library. Thank you all for joining us this evening for a really terrific talk on understanding obesity from stigma to solutions. It's my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. Sun Kim. Dr. Kim is an associate professor of endocrinology who specializes in the treatment of type 2 diabetes, polycystic ovary syndrome, and obesity. She is particularly devoted to helping individuals change their lifestyles and achieve sustained improvements in their health. Dr. Kim conducts research to better understand risk factors for diabetes and to develop better treatments for diabetes. She also works closely with the Reproductive Endocrinology Group to help women improve their health, lose weight, and maximize their chances for a successful pregnancy. You're welcome to enter questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And at the end of the lecture, Dr. Kim will answer as many of those questions as possible. Thank you, Dr. Kim, for being here tonight. I'm going to turn the screen over to you. Thank you so much for that introduction. I'm happy today to discuss with you some topics related to obesity. The formal title of my talk is Understanding Obesity from Stigma to Solutions. I want to start off talking about weight stigma, which is not often discussed publicly, but there is a social stigma um, for patients with obesity. And I want to start off by saying that there is a lot of evidence suggesting that body weight regulation is complex and it's not entirely under voluntary control. There are clearly biological, genetic, and environmental factors which contribute to obesity. Some of the questions that I would like to address today is first, how do we define obesity? What are the complications associated with obesity and excessive weight gain? And what are current solutions? The definition for obesity that we use medically is a condition characterized by excessive accumulation and storage of fat in the body. So when we're discussing obesity, it's excess of fat as opposed to uh, muscle. We do have a common metric that we use called a body mass index, and it gives us a surrogate estimate of a degree of fatness in the body. The way that body mass index or BMI is calculated, we use weight in kilograms divided by height and meter square. You can see that a healthy body mass index is often defined as 18.5 to 24.9. And overweight is defined as having a body mass index 25 or greater. And being obese is medically defined as having a body mass index of 30 or greater. These are not perfect uh, metrics for degree of fatness, but we do use it medically and it can be associated with certain diseases associated with obesity. Now, a, a lot of people sometimes uh, like to understand where do people fall, especially in the United States, in these categories? I will tell you in sort of the latest assessment of the range of body mass index in the United States suggests that 73% or more individuals living in the United States are either overweight or obese. So a great majority of individuals in the United States are either overweight or obese, and only roughly one in four would classify as being in this healthy body mass index. This trend for higher BMI is not just in the United States, but it's really a global issue. If you are interested in calculating your own body mass index, there are a lot of online calculators that you can use. You can also calculate it your, yourself based on your weight and your height, or you can look at charts like this. So if you look down this vertical row, you'll see your height, and then across up here is weight. So for example, if you're 5'2 and you have a weight of 170 pounds, your body mass index is 31. 
So what is responsible for excess weight gain? So I'm sure if you're joining this talk, this is something you've thought about or read about. You hear a lot about our current modern lifestyle. It does play a role because we have ready access to a lot of uh, high calorie dense foods. In addition, our general lifestyle is less active than our ancestors. We're learning a lot about genetic uh, predisposition to weight gain and body size. I couldn't tell you one gene that you should go out and get checked for this, but there's a lot of research involved in understanding the genetic underpinnings of weight and excess weight gain. Certainly our modern environment. And then I am an endocrinologist and we also look for hormonal causes. And I know a lot of patients are interested in understanding if there's an underlying disease associated with their weight gain. Some common things that we check for is your thyroid function to see if your thyroid is underactive. We call that hypothyroidism. We also check for another hormone called cortisol. And excess production of cortisol can be associated also with unwanted weight gain. What are the complications associated with excess of weight gain and obesity? I know it's hard probably to see individual details in this slide. So that was not my intention, but just to say that we're learning about a lot of diseases associated with having excessive weight gain and uh, increase in fat mass. And the one that's probably uh, most commonly known is type two diabetes, which is strongly associated with uh, additional weight gain in someone with high risk for diabetes. And diabetes is uh, located right here, but it really, the diseases range anywhere from uh, even cognition, risk for strokes in the brain, all the way down to joint pains. Um, and so the diseases associated with excess weight gain are vast. And if you have questions about this, I'm happy to address this at the end. But um, actually the couple other things that I wanted to point out, um, cancer is also associated with excess weight gain, heart disease, and then something you may hear more about is liver disease. Something called non-alcoholic fatty liver disease has also been associated with obesity. Um, I can't forget to mention uh, COVID-19, which has also been associated with severe, um, obesity has been associated with uh, risk for severe infection associated with COVID-19. I know this past year has been hard for almost everyone um, facing the pandemic, either uh, personally or with friends or with the lifestyle that uh, changes that it has led to. To give you some example of the association between obesity and disease, I want to highlight obesity and risk for severe in infection with COVID-19, since we have all have had collective experience with some aspects of COVID-19. So you can look here on the x-axis is that body mass index or BMI that we went over. So the higher the body mass index, with COVID-19, there appeared to be higher risk for hospitalization with infection associated with COVID-19. Also, it increased uh, intensive care unit admissions. So that signifies that you're sicker as a result of COVID-19 infection. This uh, refers to mechanical ventilation, a breathing machine that is used for severe infection associated with COVID-19. So that also increased with increasing in body mass index. And then finally, unfortunately, death has also been associated with increase in BMI and death associated with COVID-19. So, uh, you know, one common question that comes up is why is this the case? And I'm, I'm gonna talk a little bit about what may be the underpinning for this, but this is just to illustrate sort of one um, effect potentially of excess weight gain. I did also discuss 
uh, the risk for diabetes. There are different types of diabetes and type two diabetes is the most common type. Over 90% of individuals with diabetes have type two diabetes. And it has a strong association with body mass index and excess weight gain. This is one example. Again, on the x-axis is body mass index. And the higher your starting body mass index, the greater your future risk for type two diabetes. These lines represent two different cohort studies in women and men who were followed for years to, to evaluate their risk of developing diabetes. And the higher your starting body mass index, the greater your future risk for diabetes. And it seems to you know, uh, go up as your body mass index increases. Uh, one other sort of graphic example of the association between weight and diabetes are these maps of the United States. I don't know how many of you have seen these maps showing a prevalence of obesity defined as a body mass index of 30 or greater um, and prevalence of diabetes um, defined by different sort of uh, years in the United States. So we're starting out with 1994, 2000, and 2015. The color codes are down here, and the darker you get, the greater the percentage of individuals living in each of these states with obesity. So the dark red refers to at least 26% of individuals in that state having obesity. And you can see from 1994 to 2015 that we've gotten much uh, darker, um, signifying that the prevalence of obesity has increased. In addition to that trend, there has been a trend for increased prevalence of diabetes. This is usually refers to type two diabetes because that's the most common type. So the redder, um, the, the color scheme signifies greater individuals with diabetes in that state. And the reddest refers to at least 9% of individuals in that state um, having diabetes. So you can see the trend for obesity and diabetes seem to mirror one another. But why does excess weight gain cause health effects? I want to show you in this simple schema where our extra fat gets stored. Everyone has a degree of fat and it's right underneath your skin layer. So if your outside is the skin right, sort of underneath that layer is your fat layer. We call that subcutaneous fat. And then below that is muscle. This is a very simple scheme of the tissues um, in your outer layer of your body. We can look at more fancy imaging and you can kind of get a sense of this fat layer right underneath the skin, sort of all around. And most of our fat is in this subcutaneous area, like at least 90%. But there are other areas where you can store fat. It's important for us to store fat um, as a depot for calories in times of fasting so that you can draw upon that store when you're not eating. I recently saw this schema that I liked. So if you equate um, eating with water falling out of a faucet into a tub, the water line may refer to your extra store of these calories in fat. So consider this your subcutaneous fat. Of course, you're gonna draw upon this storage of fat just you know, for your activities of daily living. So you need energy uh, just to breathe and to eat and to carry on the functions of your activities of daily living. So let's call that basal metabolism. There's other ways that you burn fat. I won't go into these, but there are other ways even just fidgeting burns extra calories and takes upon the storage of calories, your fat layer. Of course, physical exertion will also use up these calorie stores. 
But what happens if eating um, gets to a point where you overfill this tub? So this is, you know, would be a dramatic example. I'm not saying that this is sort of what happens, but what happens to the extra calories if you cannot store it in that subcutaneous layer of fat? What we're learning is uh, when you overeat to the point where your capacity to store fat is exceeded, then some of that go, fat goes into other places. It can go in an intra-abdominal area um, called visceral adipose tissue. It can actually also get stored in your organs. It can go into your heart. I briefly mentioned something uh, called fatty liver, which is becoming more and more common. So your extra fat can be stored or made um, and stay in, in your liver, but it can also cause problems. So we believe that at least partially some of the effects of excess weight gain, excess fat, relates to storage of this fat outside of the subcutaneous layer of fat. And some people call that ectopic fat, you know, fat outside of where uh, perhaps it should be. And again, it can be in a lot of organs, it can be intra-abdominal, but some of this uh, leads to uh, a grander term called inflammation in your body because this fat is not where it's supposed to be. And that that inflammation can lead to fibrosis in the organ and lead to end stage damage of that organ. So this is an active area of research. I want to spend the remainder of the time talking about solutions. And there are maybe three prongs to these, these potential solutions. I think foundational is lifestyle changes. And maybe some of you are, are sick of that term because maybe you heard it from your own physician. So I do think lifestyle changes are foundational. I'm not gonna spend as much time on that, not because I don't think it's important, but I, I wanna talk about topics you may not have heard much about, including weight loss medications and weight loss surgery. I do have to spend some time on lifestyle changes because I don't want you to feel that I am shirking that because again, for any weight loss program you take on, lifestyle changes are foundational and the most important. And the two areas of lifestyle changes to consider are your eating plan and your exercise plan. There are lots of diets, there are popular diets, there are books written about diets, but I would say the, the common themes that no one disagrees with are two things that I hope you can take away from today's talk, is if you're embarking on a different eating plan, think about limiting the intake of added sugars and something called refined grains. Refined grains are grains that have been stripped of their nutrients. So refined grains versus whole grains. So a common example would be white bread versus wheat bread. Um, if you have more questions about this, I'm happy to answer that in the question and answer. I would also encourage you to try to increase non-starchy vegetables. I'm sure some of you love vegetables and other uh, people don't. I always recommend people try to eat three different types of non-starchy vegetables a day. So try to make that part of your eating plan. And then for exercise plan, a good goal um, to keep in mind is trying to accomplish at least 150 minutes of moderate intensity exercise. You can break that down into 30 minutes, five days a week. This is my last uh, slide sort of talking about diet, but I wanted to make this uh, point that I know uh, many people in this audience, especially living in the Bay Area, um, have embraced eating whole foods and eating vegetables. But if you look at us as a nation, we're not very good at eating certain foods. One includes vegetables. This slide refers to dietary intake in the US population. And this line refers to 
people meeting the goal recommendations for each of this, these diet areas. If you're above the line, you're exceeding recommendations. And if you're below, you're below recommendations. So if you even look at total vegetables, only about 10% of the US population is at or above goal for vegetable intake. It's also true with fruit. Only up to maybe 20% of us are at or above goal for fruit intake. The area that we're really great at is refined grains. The grains that I told you we should limit were actually above recommendations, over 90% of us. So if you can take some dietary advice, think about ways to decrease added sugar and refined grains in your diet and try to increase vegetable intake, three a day. I also recommend two fruits a day. Now switching gears to weight loss medications. Whenever I talk to patients about weight loss medications, many people are surprised that we even have weight loss medications. Well, uh, we do. And currently for long-term management of weight, we have five medications with this last one just being approved this month. So this talk was timely. And I'm gonna spend some time talking about this medication, but we have actually five different medications. Not, you know, every physician is comfortable prescribing these medications. And some of these medications may not be covered by insurance. And I think that leads to underutilization of these medications. Most of these medications work by decreasing appetite, except for this one called Orlistat, which decreases absorption of fat. There was also a device. It, it's, it seems like a medicine because you swallow capsules, um, but it's considered a device called Plenty that was also approved in 2019. It, it, the capsules expand in your stomach so that you want to ingest less food but I'm not gonna be talking about this in the talk, but I'm happy to take questions about it. Now, what are the indications for weight loss medications? Currently, we use a body mass index of 30 or greater. If you have a body mass below this, uh, 27 or greater, uh, it would require that you have at least one disease, we call it comorbidity, associated with obesity. And it includes type 2 diabetes, which I mentioned. It can include a host of other diseases, including high blood pressure, high cholesterol, sleep apnea, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Now, um, before I talk some about the weight loss medications, I also want to talk to you about weight loss surgery. The two most common types of weight loss surgery done include something called Roux-en-Y gastric bypass or sleeve gastrectomy. This is a cartoon of your stomach. When you eat, food goes down your esophagus into your stomach and then into your small intestines. In sleeve gastrectomy, you make the stomach smaller but you still have all your intestinal use. In ruin my gastric bypass, you make the stomach pouch smaller and you also bypass a great portion of the stomach and the upper intestine so that this small pouch gets connected to your distal small intestines. So again, you're bypassing a big chunk of your native stomach and upper intestine. What are the indications for weight loss surgery? Again, we use body mass index, but this cut point is higher. It's up to 40 as opposed to 30 for medications associated with weight loss. You can also have a body mass index lower than 40 with one or more diseases associated with obesity. Similar to with medications for weight loss, they could include type two diabetes, high blood pressure, sleep apnea, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. There also has been pushed to lower this criteria further to a BMI of 30 to 34.9, especially if you have diabetes or a collection of diseases associated with obesity. 
Now, I want you to uh, take a moment. Uh, you may have different reasons for joining um, this talk. I'm sure one of the reasons may include the fact that you're embarking on a weight loss plan. What weight would make you happy? Or what, uh, how much weight loss would you like to achieve? I often ask my patients this. So I want you to think about what would make you happy at this time. Long time ago, someone did ask individuals what weight loss reduction they you know, expect. And a, a lot of individuals want a really high degree of weight loss and acceptable was at least 25% of their starting weight. So that would mean if you had a starting weight of 218 pounds, you'd wanna go down to 163 pounds. And they would be disappointed if they only lost 17% of their weight. I will tell you as a physician, I'm often aiming for at least 10% weight loss. And that would make me ecstatic because it's hard to lose weight. And we also know that at least 5 to 10% of weight loss can have health benefits. So if we look at expected weight loss, with medications, um, we're helping individuals achieve five to 10% weight loss. And that might be surprising to you and on the low end, but that's what existing medications are able to help individuals achieve about five to 10% weight loss with medications. With surgery, you can achieve higher degree of weight loss, 25 to 30%. So you can see that there's a huge gap between 5 to 10% weight loss and 25 to 30% weight loss. However, recently, one of the medications that was approved, the one I told you was just approved, may be you know, filling this gap somewhat by allowing patients to reach up to 15% of, or more um, weight loss. So you're going to hear a lot about newer medications that potentially fill this gap. So to round out some discussions about medications associated with weight loss, I want to show you expected weight loss um, after taking these medications. And if you have questions in the question and answer, I'm happy to go individually through each of these medications. However, for sake of time, I'm not giving you details about each medication. So this is a four different medications that have been approved for long-term weight loss. And this is weight loss that you may see at one year after taking these medications. And then sort of this aqua bar refers to the drug and this green bar refers to placebo or people not on that drug. Usually in these weight loss studies, people are also given uh, some sort of a lifestyle approach as well in terms of changing their diet and exercise. And you can see medications um, can help you reach a weight loss at one year of, of maybe 5% up to maybe 9%. So these are uh, currently existing medications. And if you took them for one year, as opposed to if you take the placebo or you don't take the drug, and you follow the lifestyle plan, you may achieve maybe 2% weight loss. So there is a significant difference between drug and placebo. The new medicine, and I, you know, I'm not trying to push this new medicine, but I must say being a, a doctor who helps patients with weight loss, I was uh, very happy to have this drug come to market because of that gap in uh, weight loss that we were ne never able to bridge. But if you look at this medicine, up to uh, individuals who took this medicine for one year or more could attain uh, close to 15% weight loss on average. Of course, with every weight loss study I've ever been involved in, there are people who lose a lot more than average and people who don't lose any weight or even gain weight. So there's a big spread in how people do. But for this medication, on average, it was 15% compared to these other drugs, which uh, did not reach 10%. So again, most of these drugs affect your appetite. So decreased appetite and decreased intake 
of calories, except for orlistat, which reduces absorption of fat. Um, I, I don't wanna leave you with a sobering message, but one question I often get is, okay, I'm excited to try medications for weight loss, but when I get to my goal weight, can I stop? Well, any weight loss endeavor you take upon either yourself or with medications, there is uh, weight regain that's potential. And if you look here, the x-axis refers to years after weight loss. Let's say, um, for whatever amount, percent of lost weight regain. So let's say you reach your goal weight loss here at time zero. At one year, uh, you may regain a quarter of the weight that you lost. And then by five years, you may regain up to 80% of the weight that you lost. But there are people, and um, they include some of my patients, that have maintained weight loss for years and years, but that is an active process. What about weight loss after surgery? I think uh, weight loss after surgery can be more durable or last longer than weight loss associated with uh, your own endeavors or with medications if you stop medications. However, there is still variability Look at this ruin my gastric bypass. Usually people attain their you know, peak weight around six months to a year. So this study looked at individuals at that six month mark. Of, again, you know, people lost about 25 to 30% of their starting weight. And then there are uh, some who start to regain weight. Um, some who may maintain and then regain a, you know, a little bit later. And that's about a quarter of individuals. About half may stay at their same weight, and this is up to three years. And then there are people who also uh, you know, lose more weight after that six month mark. So there's, again, a lot of variability when people embark on a weight loss uh, plan or journey. I wanna um, end with uh, something that I alluded to is weight maintenance. After you lose weight, Weight maintenance is also an active process. Um, it seems like losing weight is hard, but maintaining weight can also uh, take efforts. And I uh, really appreciate this study. It was also a recent study where they looked at how best to maintain weight after you lose weight. So these individuals, um, were given a very low calorie diet plan. Uh, I believe it was 800 calories per day for eight weeks. And they only took individuals who were successful at losing weight, at least 5% or more of their starting weight was lost. So this uh, represents about 14 kilos or about 30 pounds. So a lot of weight was lost at eight weeks. And then they were randomized to four arms. What happens if after you lose that weight, uh, you know, you're given placebo or, you know, no drug and kind of told, you know, good luck. Um, the second arm is exercise. So they were coached on exercising. That was either 150 minutes of moderate intensity um, exercise per week or 75 minutes of vigorous intensity exercise per week. And they had coaching throughout the study. And this goes up to 52 weeks. A third arm was a drug called loraglutide. Um, and the fourth arm was exercise plus this drug. And you can see uh, this is the starting point after they've lost weight. If you do nothing, you will start to regain weight. And true to the slide that I showed before, about a year point, you may you know, regain a quarter or more of your weight that you lost. If you exercise, you were better at maintaining this weight that you lost. If you got medications, you may lose a little bit more weight, but at least it helped you maintain the weight. But the best was you know, medications and exercise. So my point with this is saying that if you put in the investment to lose weight, maintaining that weight loss will also take efforts to maintain. But once you get 
your habits or lifestyle going, it will get easier. And I'm happy to take questions about that too at the end. So my conclusion is excess weight gain is associated with several medical diseases. I do want to emphasize that just because you gain weight does not mean you will get any one of the diseases I discuss. It does increase risk and it will depend also on your genetic risk for those diseases. Some of the solutions for weight loss include lifestyle changes, which I believe is foundational to any plan you undertake. But potential options include weight loss medications or weight loss surgery. And then finally, uh, understanding that maintaining the weight loss is also a very active process. Thank you. And Thank you, Dr. Kim, for so much useful information. Um, we have some questions from the audience. Yes, so um, I, I, I had a little bit of a chance uh, to scroll, but obviously um, not a comprehensive time. I would start off, um, you, thanks for being a great audience. I, I think there was some buzzing, so I'm sorry about that. Um, you guys ask a lot of questions uh, that my patients are also interested in. One of the first questions that came in was about cortisol. A lot of people are interested in cortisol. It's a hormone sometimes equated with stress, but it can be a, a very important uh, life-saving hormone. And it's made from a gland called the adrenals. And you have two adrenals on top of your kidneys. The type of um, excess cortisol that we're looking for when you come to see me in endocrine clinic is excessive production of cortisol. Sometimes this is called you know, hypercortisolism or Cushing's syndrome or disease. You can have sort of a slightly elevated cortisol level from a day-to-day -day extreme stress or um, over intake of alcohol. And um, cortisol itself, kind of the stress associated with that can lead to um, your body holding on more maybe to, um, or actually it, it will increase your hunger um, and so it leads to generally eating more. A common medication that mimics that finding is something called prednisone. I don't know if any of you have ever taken prednisone, but it can make you very hungry. It can also kind of redistribute your fat. And there's a certain type of physique uh, that's common with someone with excess cortisol. But the type that we're looking for in endocrine clinic is very uncommon, whereas um, stress-induced elevations in cortisol uh, can be common. It's hard to know how much of a role that that's playing, but stress is definitely a factor to you know people's day-to-day -day and how it affects your lifestyle. I mean, I only focused on two things for lifestyle, your eating plan and your um, exercise, but obviously your whole self, including stress, um, your ability to, to sleep, your mental health, all of those things are very critical. Um, moving on to another question, someone asked me about leptin. Um, I know there are uh, some clinics that measure leptin. Leptin is a hormone made from your fat cells. And in general, leptin um, equates to kind of the degree of fat you have in your body. Leptin works in your brain to lower appetite. And so some people wonder then, um, you know, if your fat cells make leptin and you have excess fat, why doesn't that feed back to decrease appetite um, more severely? And so some people have come up with this concept of leptin resistance, but I don't really find at this stage um, any benefit to measuring uh, leptin. There was a lot of interest in leptin thinking that that was a cause of a lot of obesity in, in people who um, either lacked leptin or didn't have the receptor for it, but that does not seem to be a common cause for weight. Um, someone did ask me about semi-glutide and I wanna tell you a little bit about it because I, I, know I was super excited. It is um, a drug that was recently approved for weight loss, but I wanna let you know that semi-glutide has been approved for treatment of diabetes for some time. It's just that the recent approval um, was for um, management of weight and it's at a higher dose than we use for people with diabetes. So, but it's something that we, we especially in endocrine clinic, uh, have, we've been using a lot. It's just the dose is different. For diabetes, 
semi-glutide, the brand name is called Azempic. And then for obesity, the brand name is called Wegovi. And the dose is different. In diabetes, the top dose is one milligram. And for obesity, the top dose has increased to 2.4 milligram. Um, as with any drugs, I always tell people, um, you know, you always, there's benefits and risks and side effects. The most common side effect is nausea and diarrhea, but some people can also get constipation. So it, it you know, um, it has shown really great promise for weight loss, but there are um, side effects to consider. We do generally start with a really low dose and increase. Um, some other things uh, that I saw, um, Someone asked me about liposuction, why don't we do it? Um, liposuction is still done cosmetically. Interestingly, even though I said, oh, um, excess fat can lead to medical diseases, there have been studies looking to see if liposuction has any health benefits and it doesn't. So in general, um, weight loss has to be come from sort of an endogenous process for it to have health benefits. Um, let's see, you guys are very good about asking um, lots of questions. Um, oh, um, I also get a lot of questions about menopause. And as a female, I really appreciate this question. It's a big change in someone's life to go through menopause. There have been a, a large scale study looking at sort of the menopause transition and how it affects weight. If you've personally gone through it, um, you may feel that you know a lot has happened during that time. But when we've uh, followed lots of women, there isn't this dramatic increase in weight at menopause. However, both men and women uh, seem to gain uh, weight um, sort of in their late adulthood, and it can be up to you know a pound a year, which can you know really add up after a few decades. I will tell you, as you get older, your metabolic rate may change or your activity rate may change. And so uh, the amounts of calories that you intake may also need to be adjusted, which is, which is the part that may be difficult. Um, but someone who asked the question about menopause asked about the effects of these drugs. And it seems that these drugs you know, work equally um, regardless of sort of the age or menopause status. But it's just that as we get older, there are certain changes that make, uh, you know, um, make it so that you may have to put in more effort for this. But, you know, weight loss just is hard. And I, I, I tell my patients that um, because most patients that come to see me feel that they're sort of the only ones struggling with this. Um, there are very few people where it's um, very, you know, easy to, you know, maintain their weight and never gain weight. So I, I do want to um, empathize that it is, it is hard, but can be done. But we also have a lot of additional ways that we can support patients. I think someone also asked um, about a stigma from doctors, and I'm I'm sorry about that. But obviously, you know, you if you've seen a doctor, you know that you know we're all human. We all have different personalities, and um, some patients have. I mean, some physicians have certain views about weight, um, but people who you know work in um, clinics that support patients on their weight loss journey uh, appreciate uh, this stigma and try to be uh, very cognizant of it. I you know, once had a patient say that um, no matter what she came in with to see the doctor, she felt that the message was, well, if you just lost weight, you know, X would go away. And um, so she really felt that she wasn't heard. And if you felt that way, you know, I, I'm sorry. But um, there are lots of physicians now that are here to support you without uh, that bias. Let's see. I don't know, I, uh, Jillian, I don't know if you were able to see other um, questions. Um, oh, um, someone did ask about eating plan used after surgery. Um, that is a pretty, um, I, I'm, I'm guessing you're asking me about the eating plan after weight loss surgery. That can be pretty intense because first you sort of start out with the liquid diet and then you advance your diet. Um, 
you know, we have a you know great surgical team, and and they actually recently gave a part of this talk a couple of weeks ago. Um, it, it's not a diet that you can you know maintain for a long time. Sometimes um, there comes a situation where you may have to lose weight more quickly. Let's say you know you need to undergo surgery, and it was recommended that you undergo uh, weight loss a little bit quicker. I'm more of the mindset of, you know, what can we do sort of to change your lifestyle for the long haul, not for the short run. But some patients, if they've been struggling with it for a while, they um, gain more confidence if there are greater results. And, and there are ways that we can support that with, um, you know, meal replacements. But it would be really hard to um, follow the diet after the surgery for the long haul. Anyone can do it sort of for the short term, but it'd be difficult to do it for the long haul. Um, let's see. So, um, there was a question about uh, hormones and obesity. So um, just a little word on um, an what an endocrinologist does. So we do deal with lots of different hormones. I did mention the two hormones that, you know, we look for um, associated with weight. I'm hoping that sort of in the future, we, we will expand the type of evaluation we do, but regulation of your appetite and eating, it's, it's really complex. There's several neural pathways. Your body really does try to, um, hold on to calories in the way that it was advantageous uh, for time of stress or famine. And so I guess in today's society, that's deleterious, but I, we're, you know, learning more, but we uh, don't, even though we know a lot of hormones affect uh, weight, either increasing appetite or decreasing appetite in the clinic, we, we don't check them all. We're not modulating them. But um, interestingly, that semi-glutide mimics a hormone called GLP-1 or glucagon-like peptide 1 that's actually made after eating in your intestines. And so that uh, sort of, we learned more about that, how that works, and that got developed to help patients with diabetes and also with weight. There's another drug in development using dual gut hormones, um, which I think you'll hear more about in the, in the future. So I think in that way, we are trying to use hormones to our benefit to help patients. Well, uh, thank you, Dr. Kim, for this really wonderful presentation and for sharing all this important information with us. And thanks to our audience, at home for tuning in. Uh, if you'd like additional information or resources, please contact the health library at healthlibrary.stanford.edu. Thanks everyone, have a great night.